Hey, buddy, watch this. Hello, hello, Regis Kelvin is the name and Hearthstone is the game. And this is part 16 of my Journey to and Grow card review. The final part, in fact, of my review. I've got 31 cards this time around, including uh, the remaining Warlock class cards and all the remaining uh, neutral cards as well. So I think by the end of this review, I will have discussed every single card upcoming in Journey to and Grow. So let's go ahead and jump into the review. And keep in mind, since there are so many cards, I'm going to be moving through these pretty quickly not taking quite as much time as I may have in earlier reviews to discuss each card, just because there's still so many. Uh, but up first is Blood Bloom, a new spell from Warlock. This time the next spell you cast this turn costs health instead of mana. So sort of that Cho'Gall effect, but this time instead of being attached to a 7 cost minion, this is a 2 mana spell. So essentially this is kind of like Innervate, but an Innervate with... Uh, no real cap on how much extra mana it can give you. In other words, uh, you can play this on turn two and cast Siphon Soul. So you can innervate out a Siphon Soul. Now, of course, that comes at a cost to your health, which is a pretty big downside, but potentially huge tempo gains here. You could turn two Twisting Nether, for instance, which is pretty crazy, actually, the potentials here. Uh, all those have downsides with their health, but of course Warlock is a class that has typically been happy to sacrifice itself in order to make some sort of other gain on the board or via card advantage. Now, the only downside here is that Reno Jackson is actually rotating out of standard format, so uh, risking your health is becoming a little bit more punishing than it perhaps used to be for a deck like Reno Lock. So the downsides here might be higher than they would have been in the past, so it's going to take a little bit of a balancing act to figure out how much you can actually pull off with a card like Blood Bloom, but it still seems like a sort of high tempo card that might be ran in control oriented, maybe Kazakis style Warlock decks. So I like this card quite a bit actually. I think it's really good. It's just um, it's going to require the right deck and the right uh, the right balance to make it work. So move on to Feeding Time. This is a new five mana spell. It's basically Implosion, <laughs> but uh, Implosion without the RNG range. In other words, this one does exactly 3 damage to a minion, and it summons exactly 3 1-1 one, one Terror Daxes. So it's the middle roll for Implosion. If you remember, Implosion could do 2 to 4 damage and summon um, 2 to 4 imps, I think was the numbers. Uh, so this is the middle roll. You're real happy when it hit 4 on Implosion, but you're real sad when it low rolled. Uh, but this just guarantees your roll, but it does come actually at an extra mana cost. So I don't think this is quite as good as Implosion was, just because those high rolls could essentially be a game-winning kind of play. But uh, it's still okay. I just think that the mana cost is a little bit prohibitive. Being able to spin some removal on turn 4 is typically far better than on turn 5. You can compare this to something like Jade Lightning, for instance, and this probably doesn't line up all that nicely. I mean, the first time you cast Jade Lightning, it's giving you a 1-1, one, one, but occasionally it gives you like a 4-4, four, four, and that is arguably often much, much better than just multiple 1-1 one, one minions. So I don't love this card. It's, it's not terrible, but I don't think it's going to be quite good enough to see play. Moving on to Tar Lurker, a new 5-mana minion. It's a tar style minion, which as we now know, all these tar minions apparently have taunt. And they gain attack during your opponent's turn. So this one's a 1-7 by default, but it becomes a 4-7 on your opponent's turn. And a 4-7 taunt for 5 mana is uh, definitely pretty solid. It's above what you'd expect uh, for vanilla stats, so you are getting a nice little bonus here. And the downside, of course, that it has 1 attack on your turn isn't typically going to be that problematic, I think, uh, when you're focused on being in a defensive deck. But I do have to say that that is slightly worse in Warlock than in other classes because of the card Shadow Flame. Uh, there's a downside here that you can't Shadow Flame this minion. Not that you'd want to Shadow Flame a big taunt minion typically, but there are those times where it's like dire situations call for that kind of play, and this one wouldn't support it. You'd have a terrible Shadow Flame instead of a four damage shadow flame because we've all seen twilight drake's shadow flame before too so i mean still probably a good card still something that you could run in a control warlock to slow down some aggressive decks i think it'll be fine just one thing to keep in mind compared to other classes or neutral tar minions that might uh, be better in uh, other environments 
So let's move on to the Chittering Tunneler. This is a new 3 mana, 3-3, three, three, Beast, which we've seen quite a few Beasts in Ungaro in general, and actually even in Warlock. Uh, this one has a battle cry that allows you to discover a spell, and then you'll deal damage to your hero equal to its cost, so yet another trade-off there for your health, which probably isn't too terrible. Uh, and, and this is sort of the Ivory Knight for Paladin, but backwards instead of gaining health based on the cost. Uh, this one actually uh, does some damage to you. That said, I don't really know that this minion's all that good. I mean, that's a discovering a spell is awesome, right? Uh, but doing damage to yourself isn't free, and there's not like you're getting a ton of extra stats for that. In other words, I think the battle cry here kind of balances itself out a little bit. You're already paying a price for the benefit of discovering a spell, so I might expect the minion to be a three-four, for instance, instead of just. A 3-3. Three, three. If you compare this to something like Tomb Spider, for instance, that's a 4-mana 3-3 three, three with no downside on its discovery effect. So, um, Chittering Tunneler, you know, is one less mana, so I guess they're kind of comparable in that regard. But, but still, I just don't know that this card is good enough. And Warlock does have some really good spells, but they also have some not-so-great spells, so you're not always going to get what you want. You know, you might get Sense Demons in there and throw off the the average quality of your spells quite a bit. So Chittering Tunneler has some chances to backfire. And because of that, and because I just don't know that the body's good enough, and that there's that downside with the health, I'm not sure that this one's great, because it doesn't provide extra board presence or tempo, like the first card that we discussed can provide a lot of early game tempo and, and help you accelerate quite a bit. This one doesn't do that. It's more of a value play than a tempo play. So Chittering Tunneler uh, is, is okay, but not my favorite. And then there's the Cool Dinomancer, a new 6-mana 5-5 five, five minion with a Death Rattle. Summon a random minion that you discarded this game. And as you probably know, with the new Warlock quest and some of the new Warlock cards in general, discarding is going to be an even bigger mechanic for Warlock. And I already, frankly, thought they had enough new discard rewarding cards in this set to make that a really viable thing. In other words, half the time you discard, you're actually going to get a benefit instead of pay a price. And here's yet another one that helps you uh, take advantage of discarded cards. So Cruel Dinomancer is feeding into that discard frenzy a little bit. Plus, this is another sort of mid rangey style discard minion and it seems like some of the discard stuff was starting to curve up in mana cost as far as Unguro is concerned. So it feels like a mid-range discard warlock focused on achieving the quest is going to be a scary good deck with this kind of card in mind. Because frankly, a 6-mana 5-5 five five is not terrible on its own. That's a good stat allocation for good 6-drops. We've seen so many good 6-drops of those stats, Sylvanas, Thorasan, all those kinds of cards. Uh, and a strong death rattle like this means you could get, you know, a Doom Guard back too, right? So, or maybe get a Jaraxxus back if you discard Jaraxxus. Who knows? But uh, you're probably going to summon something halfway decent most of the time if you're discarding stuff in a mid range style deck. So, uh, Cruel Dynamancer seems very strong to me. So, now we'll move on to the neutral cards that are remaining. Up first is the Egg Napper. A 3-mana three 3-1 three with the Death Rattle Summon, 2 one, one Raptors. So this is kind of, you know, a slightly more expensive Haunted Creeper, I think, is the first comparison that comes to mind for me. But I actually don't think it's as good as Haunted Creeper. That one health means it can be pretty easily pinged off, and then the, the Raptors are just sort of incidental, typically stuff that's going to die to Whirlwind Effects or AoE. Um, so, I mean, in total, you're getting like 5-3 in stats out of this guy, which is good for a 3-drop, but since they're so spread across and they're all so susceptible at one health... I just don't think it's really comparable at all, and uh, this minion will probably just not do enough. The raptors are beasts, but the egg napper, even though he's a turtle, is not a beast, apparently, because he's some sort of humanoid turtle. So there's not, like, any extra beast synergies here or anything. So I don't think egg napper's gonna, gonna make the cut. Uh, up next, though, is Rock Pool Hunter, a new 2-mana two 2-3 two, murloc that gives a friendly murloc, plus 1, plus 1. Uh, this is great. This is a good card. This is like Shattered Sun Cleric from Murlocs but a mana cost cheaper. And of course the stats are flipped a little bit, but it too has Murloc synergy because it's a Murloc. And uh, any kind of Murloc deck that's board based, it seems like this card's gonna work really nicely. So maybe some sort of mid rangey Murloc Shaman based on the quest. Rockpool Hunter fits right in there. Just gives your board more consistency and more strength in the early game. And, and of course this can trigger all the other Murloc stuff too. So 
I like Rock Pool Hunter quite a bit. This is this feels like one of the best sort of core Murlocs we've seen in a long time as far as stats and effect are concerned. Usually if they have a strong effect, their stats kind of suck. But a nice big health pool on this one and uh, a really positive battle cry too makes Rock Pool Hunter seem like he's going to be a very, very good addition to the Murloc set. Then up next is Nesting Rock, a new 5 mana uh, neutral beast. It's a 4-7 and it has a battle cry if you control at least two other minions gain taunt and uh this this is a good minion i think a five mana four seven again great stats for a five drop particularly if you get taunt like that's a lot to work with for a taunt minion at five now that said i don't know how often a deck is going to have multiple minions on the board and need a strong five mana taunt in other words if you already are kind of early game board focused you might not need a card like this uh, and aggressive decks that get more minions out onto the board more consistently might not need a card like this. Uh, but it would certainly be a good one in those scenarios. It just There's probably any deck that could meet this condition consistently. I think they're going to have a better 5-drop available that more specifically addresses the needs of the deck than sort of just a neutral beast minion. But in Hunter in particular, maybe even in Druid... With um, the beast synergies available, this card seems playable. I, I think it's surprisingly good for just a neutral 5-drop, which we do need some new neutral 5-drops because Azurdrake is leaving. So keep an eye out on this one for beast decks in particular that rely on beast synergies because Nesting Rock could become a surprisingly important part of those decks. So let's move on to the Humongous Razor Leaf, a new 3-mana 4-8 minion that can't attack. So this is another card in the vein of something like Ancient Watcher, for instance, that's good in silence style decks. Maybe this card can make Purify halfway decent. Maybe you play it in Wild with Wailing Soul, that kind of stuff. It's also good with Taunt minions like Sun Fury Protector or Defender of Argus. But, you know, we've never really seen that take off. It's never really been a good deck that, that anybody's played at a high level on ladder. It's probably fun and you can do some stuff with it in lower ranks, but that said, I don't think Humongous Razor Leaf is going to be a great addition. Although I will say that along that angle, it's probably better than Ancient Watcher and some of the other stuff we've seen because it's it's still cheap but focuses on health most of all, which means it's great for the Sun Fury Protector and Defender of Argus style of play. So who knows? Maybe this is teched into um, like an old school handlock style deck where it's not reliant on Reno, but instead it's reliant on big early game taunt minions to shut down some aggression. So this could be a fun little piece in uh, Handlock in particular. I hope that makes a comeback. So moving on to the Charged Devil Soar. This is a new 8 mana 7-7 seven, oh, seven, seven beast. Uh, has charge, which is pretty cool for 7-7. Seven, seven. Uh, but of course the Battle Cry can't attack heroes this turn. So uh, it's a board presence based beast. Uh, so you can run it into the Boulder Fist Ogre of your opponents and, you know, make a good trade and keep a minion around. Uh, that said, you know, it's pretty expensive at 8 mana, even for the fact that it has charge. Ice Howl isn't a great card, is it? So I don't know that Charge Devil Soar is going to be a great card either. Ice Howl has an even more strict limitation than Charge Devil Soar does, but but still, they're kind of along the same vein. And I, I don't think this one's going to be good enough to be played. Although I have to say, the charge effect is active. If you pull this from your hand, or your, from your deck somehow, like if you... Madam Goya this out. That battle cry is not going to activate and it can actually charge heroes, which is interesting. So keep an eye out for that uh, little implication, but I doubt it's relevant either. Uh, so somewhat, to an extent, a filler card, but an, an interestingly designed one at the very least. Not just vanilla stats and boring. This is this is at least does something cool. It'll be the kind of card that makes a big impact when it comes from a random beast effect like the Jeweled Macaw or Stampede. Like This is the kind of card you're going to see be valuable in those moments, but probably not included in deck lists specifically. Moving on to the Sated Threshadon, a new 7-mana 5-7 beast with the Death Rattle Summon 3 one, one Murlocs. So this is another one of those sort of value beasts that you probably don't run in the deck itself, but again is good off of the summoning style effects like that and the random effects. Uh, it's it's fine, right? It's it's a bit like the Captured Jormunger, Um that you've seen in the past, just kind of a big statted beast. Um, the Death Rattle is nice too, don't get me wrong, but in, in total, I mean, it's it's sort of like an 8-10 in stats, but not really, because those 1-1 Murlocs aren't going to make that big of an impact on the game. 
that late. So this isn't the kind of, of minion that you actually run, but is okay off of random stuff. Uh, up next is the Primordial Drake, a new 8-mana 4-8 dragon. This guy's kind of crazy. Like, I think it's actually pretty good. Uh, but unfortunately, dragons may not actually be very good. So, a little bit of a gap here in, in when this card could have been played. But a 4-8 taunt is really annoying to deal with, just because it's a great high health total, and 4 is enough to trade into a lot of things pretty reasonably. And the battle cry is fantastic. Deal 2 damage to all other minions when you play this. So it's a board clear for little stuff. Anything that remains, you probably chip down its health enough to set up trades with Primordial Drake itself. So it's a, a really nice defensive tool, especially if you're behind on the board and you're not hurting your own minions. Uh, so I like this card a lot for a neutral card. It's, it's a good neutral dragon that's quite active on the board. You could see this in Dragon Priest in particular, I think, and it could find some success, but I just don't know that there's enough dragons left or enough dragon synergy cards. So this is the kind of card that would be necessary to reactivate Dragon at Operative and make Dragon Priest stick around, but it probably needs one or two more beyond that to really find success. So as good as this card feels to me, I don't know that we'll ever see it just because uh, dragon synergies have disappeared with uh, standard format rotation. So I hope somebody finds a deck that works and and makes Primordial Drake, uh, uh, Primordial Drake a viable card. So let's move on to the Stubborn Gastropod, a new 2-mana one, 1-2 two beast. This guy's intriguing. It has Taunt and it has Poisonous. So that's a, a very fun combination. Like Basically, if your opponent has a big minion out there, you're sort of forcing them to trade into the Stubborn Gastropod if they don't have some sort of other removal for it. So that's a neat little gimmick. It's particularly good against the new Hunter Legendary that automatically attacks stuff you play because this is just such a cheap, poisonous minion that you could kill that guy right off the bat. All that said, I think the actual applications of this card are probably a little bit more towards the gimmicky side of things than the actual viable side of things. Uh, but it is one of those minions that's probably okay to play in the early game against aggressive stuff and also okay to play in the late game as long as your opponent has exhausted you know, efficient removal for this kind of thing. So maybe, maybe, maybe it finds a home in some beast decks uh, here and there, but I suspect it won't. It's probably just a little bit in, too in between in what it actually tries to accomplish, being uh, an early costed defensive kind of card. Uh, I just don't think it's going to make the cut. So let's move on to the Stone Hill Defender. Uh, this is the Silverback Patriarch of Ungro, but clearly some power creep over the Patriarch here because same exact stats, but uh, gets to discover a taunt minion as well. And uh, we've seen some cards like this with that discover uh, a minion of their type pretty successful, like Nether Spite Historian, even um, Museum Curator. But those are really both in Priest specifically. Uh, I don't know that this card is going to be quite that good. Because by the time you get to 3 mana, you're looking to accomplish a little bit more with your minions' stats as opposed to sort of 2 mana minions. Uh, so I don't know that the sacrifice in minion quality at that point is going to be worth the discover. Plus, I think this discover effect has a much greater chance to whiff than do like Museum Curator and Nether Spike. Because both of those are picking from a pretty select pool of cards that are on average quite good. It's You're usually going to find a good dragon you're usually going to find a good Death Rattle minion. There's a chance you don't find a good taunt. There's enough bad taunts that I think half the time this card's just going to fall flat. And uh, between that and its stats, I just don't think Stonehill Defender is going to be particularly good. So let's move on to the Devil Soar Egg, the new Nerubian Egg of Journey to Enguro. But this time around, it's three mana, and it has three health. But when it dies, you get a slightly bigger minion, a 5-5 five, five Devil Soar. So, actually, the 3 health in this is a downside. You'd want it to have less health because it'd be easier to kill and therefore easier to activate the Death Rattle. But, ultimately, it's not really a downside because the way this card is going to find success is in buff-based decks where you're able to stick this on the board, your opponent is going to intentionally ignore it because they don't want to summon a Devil Soar, and then you're going to be able to buff it via like Paladin buffs, perhaps even Druid Egg-style buffs where cards like this have, have given that deck its name. And uh, then it becomes doubly frustrating because they don't want to really, they don't want to deal with the first half of it that's now buffed and scary, and it's a four-seven because of blessing of kings. <laughs> but as soon as they do deal with it, they get a five-five back. So this card will be playable. It'll be good in those kinds of decks. Maybe not outside of that. It could actually work perhaps in a death rattle priest deck 
that has some sort of AOE built in to kill these kinds of things or or um, uses other minions to activate the death rattle of which we've seen quite a few in this expansion so I think this card has a few different places it'll be played and it's actually rather good moving on to the bright eyed scout a new four mana minion uh, it's a three four and it has a battle cry draw a card and change its cost to five now this is intriguing I think this is cool I don't know if it's good I can't decide but it's a really nice effect, right? So I think this is the kind of card that sometimes it's just going to win you the game and uh, other times it's going to cost you the game. So it's just going to depend on the style of deck you're playing. But this could be good in a really late game deck with a lot of big, scary threats that are really high costed. Like say, for instance, you pull out a 5 mana Tyrion Forge Ring and get to play it on curve on 5. That's amazing, right? You pull out a 5-mana Yasharaj, which pulls out another Tyrion. That's amazing. So uh, this card's scary in that way. It might just be good enough in those kinds of decks. Uh, it's it's going to whiff and occasionally pull out your Power Word Shield and ruin Power Word Shield, I guess. Um, but the, the fact that it's a 3-4 four for 4 is obviously a little bit understated. But we've seen cards at 4-mana played with that stat allocation before, so... It might not hurt. Plus, uh, with cards like Azure Drake, right? Like, it's a 4-4 four, four for 5, and we've played that forever because it's such good card draw. So since this card draw has an upside, the stats are okay, uh, it's reasonably costed at 4, I kind of think Bright-Eyed Scout might see some play just for those potential high rolls that win you the game, as long as your deck is built to support it. I mean, obviously, you're not going to play it in a really early curve deck, but uh, this might be a one-of or even a two-of in some control decks or Reno-style decks that just need a little bit more, more curve. It could be pretty cool. So let's move on to the Emerald Reaver. It's a little one-mana 2-1 two, one beast with a battle cry deal, one damage to each hero. Uh, this feels a bit like a throwaway minion, but it could be run in a hunter deck that's looking for a lot of one-drops like we've seen that's focused on some face damage. You don't mind trading damage. If you're planning to kill your opponent faster, of course, than you die, which a lot of Hunter decks have done in the past. So not a lot here, but uh, it's not unplayable, I don't think. It's it's a fine little one-drop that could uh, spiral out of control in the Hunter Quest environment in particular. Although typically for other one-drops, you're really looking for stuff that can stick around on the board and uh, escalate in nature, kind of like the Mana Worms and Tunnel Trogs of the world that we've seen in the past. So the one health here is the real downside for the Emerald Reaver. So let's move on to the Ravasaur Runt, a new two-mana beast. It's a 2-2, two -two, and if you control at least two other minions, Adapt. Uh, I don't really think this is that great. Adapt, I've said before, is worth like maybe one mana, sometimes even less, maybe a little more sometimes. But really that means that you're getting like... A 2-2 two, two minion for 2, which is already understated. You'd expect a 3-2 or a 2-3. Occasionally it's going to be a 5-2. Occasionally it's going to be a 2-5. All that fun stuff, which is pretty good for a 2-drop. But it, the condition here is the problem. You're going to have to have two other minions. So I don't know if this is running an aggressive deck, or, but it's going to be hard to get those out on turn 2. If you draw this in the late game and you've already got a board of minions, you're probably ahead and just adding a slightly larger 2-drop to your board is not going to make a significant impact. So... Uh, I think this one's stretched a little bit too thin across deck types, and uh, I don't see a lot of value in the Ravisar Runt. So let's move on to the Giant Mastodon, a new 9-mana beast. It's a 6-10 with Taunt. I guess this is sort of the uh, Bog Creeper of this expansion, the big Taunt minion, which I think it'll be good in Arena, just because Taunts that are this big are good in Arena because people don't have that much single target removal. So it's the kind of thing that tends to stick and trade really well. But there's no reason to play this in Constructed. It's just too slow. There's so many other big taunts that you'd rather play and be able to combo with other cards in a single turn, which you often can't do with 9-mana cards. So Giant Mastodon, not a Constructed-style card. Pretty much a throwaway for that, but maybe a decent arena card in the end. So let's move on to the Giant Wasp, a new 3-mana 2-2 two -two beast with Stealth and Poisonous. Now this guy's intriguing, right? Um... First off, stealth minions lately are taken off a little bit. Like, we've seen the value in that. So this could even work in a rogue deck where you're able to buff stealth stuff. But really, anybody that runs beasts could find a reason to play this card. It's one of those cards that's good in the late game, even though it's a low drop, simply because that poisonous effect means it can trade into other stuff and uh, actually secure a kill on bigger minions. So 
It's probably decent in the early game too, just because it is a, a beast body that you can utilize for beast synergies and buffs and all that extra stuff if the deck supports that mentality, but also get some value in the late game too. So Patient Assassin upgrade is Giant Wasp, and I think Giant Wasp is considerably better than the Patient Assassin because the stats are bigger and um, it's a beast too, so it opens up some extra angles that Patient Assassin never really had. So I'm not saying this is a great card that's going to be run everywhere, but it's it's not so terrible that it couldn't squeeze its way into some of those beast style decks if they, uh, they need something like this in that place. So let's move on to the Fire Plume Phoenix, uh, a new elemental minion, and it's a 4-mana 3-3 three, three, with Battlecry deal 2 damage. And uh, I actually like this card a fair bit. I think it's it's fairly decent. Um, obviously understated for 4 mana, 3-3 three, three is not a great minion, but that Battlecry deal 2 damage, don't underestimate how valuable that can be. Uh, we've seen this before in Druid with Keeper of the Grove. Being able to ping off some sort of two health minion in the early to mid game turn four is often very valuable. We used to snipe stuff like knife jugglers uh, with that card. Now this stat allocation is a little worse, I would argue, than the Keeper of the Grove was simply because uh, if you're doing that in the early game, if you're looking to snipe off some smaller stuff, you're typically looking for a body that's a little bit more defensive in nature and able to trade into early game minions while surviving. And 4 health is considerably better than 3 health for that. But this is still fine. I mean, 3 threes aren't awful. And uh, like the Battle Cry Plus, the real upside here is that this is an elemental itself, which means it's going to fit really nicely in an elemental style deck. We've already seen two cards that are elementals like this, Fire Elemental and the new Blaze Caller. Uh, one of which is a Shaman card, but Blaze Caller is a neutral card. They all kind of do the same thing. They have a reasonable sized body for their cost. Uh, they do damage to the board on a battle cry, and um, they're all elementals. So they're all going to work together in a deck pretty nicely, I think. That said, the only reason this card wouldn't make the cut is if there's just too many good elementals, which seems like a possibility. <laughs> so it might get crowded out a little bit just because the other ones are so good. But I think this is a fine card that would fit into a lot of elemental decks. Anything that affects the board and develops a body is often a pretty good, pretty good player. So let's move on to the Sabertooth Stalker, a new 6-mana 8-2 beast with stealth. This is the Scary Stranglethorn Tiger. And uh, I don't know that it's as good as Stranglethorn Tiger, though, because 2 health is way more susceptible to AoE removal than 5 health. So the fact that it has stealth is relevant, but it's still going to die to Holy Novas and Consecrations and a lot of stuff that Stranglethorn Tiger just kind of sits there and, and eats. So it's cool, it's fun, it's uh, very aggressively statted, so if it does stick and survive, it's, it's going to be able to kill your opponents pretty quickly, but uh, I think you'd rather run Stranglethorn Tiger most of the time, and uh, this minion is likely just not going to make the cut. Although in a buff style deck, we're able to give it some additional health pretty quickly. Uh, maybe in fact it could be good enough, although I just think there's going to be other better cards to take its place. So let's move on to the Bitter Tide Hydra, a new 5-mana 8-8 eight, eight beast. Uh, whenever this minion takes damage, deal 3 damage to your hero. So I guess the nightmare here is this gets hit by like a bajillion arcane missiles, <laughs> and your hero takes, what, 24 damage off this if it, uh, if it took 8 separate blasts. That'd be the nightmare, but I think this is a card in the vein of Fell Reaver. Even a little bit 4-mana 7-7 seven, seven, where you pay some sort of price to develop a scary minion uh, relatively early in the game that your opponent just can't answer. And then you use that 8-8 eight, eight body to just pressure them to death. Fell Reaver made that successful. Like I said, uh, Flame Wreath Faceless has done that to some extent in the past. The, uh, the options seem decent for Bitter Tide Hydra, specifically since it's a beast and it has beast synergies that can activate two... There might be a home for this this card somewhere in some deck that's all in on really aggressive damage in the mid game. So I uh, don't give up on Bitter Tide Hydra. This is a, a reasonably playable card in my mind, as long as the meta supports that kind of play. So let's move on to the Vicious Fledgling, a new 3 mana 3-3 three, three beast. How many of these cards are beasts? My god, did Beast Druid and Hunter finally get an upgrade. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Anyway, after this minion attacks a hero... 
it's going to adapt. So I don't like this card. It's a very vanilla stat admin, in fact, under vanilla at 3-3. It's its upside is only achieved if you, if your opponent ignores it, and that means you're already winning the game, and uh, your opponent's in trouble probably at this point because this guy's getting to attack face consistently, and even then the the value is just not that high because one adapt per turn just isn't gonna add up to that much over time I think. Uh, so a uh, win more card, it's not even that much of a win more card because it doesn't even help you that much. So I don't think vicious fledgling. Is going to be played much at all. So moving on to another card that won't be played. This is the Frozen Crusher. Uh, new 6 mana 8-8 eight, eight, elemental. But after this minion attacks, it freezes itself. So in other words, it gets to attack every other turn. And uh, any minion that can only attack every other turn feels very bad to me. Because that means you're essentially giving your opponent opportunities to completely ignore this card. Uh, it sits there for one turn. They can ignore it. It gets to attack once. They can ignore it, it gets to attack, they can ignore it, and so on and so forth. And uh, that just doesn't feel good to me. I guess theoretically you could run this in sort of a silence deck where you silence the effect off or just silence the freeze off and get some more instant value out of it. But uh, there's other better cards if you're going to do that kind of deck. And I still, again, don't think that deck is going to be viable at, at any rate. So Frozen Crusher feels like a throwaway card to me. Everybody would just rather run Mountain Giant, I think, than this guy. So... Uh, the upside, the, the fact that it's an elemental is the only small upside, and even that's just not worth it because it's not a good enough card. And there's enough good elementals out there that there's no reason to run this one. So uh, moving on to the Emerald Hive Queen. It's a one mana, two, three beast. And the downside here is that your minions cost two more. So this, I guess, is actually the zombie chow of Journey to Nguro, or the mistress of mixtures, if you will. Uh, an overstatted one-drop minion that uh, has a downside. Now, some people might think this is more of an aggressive card, but it's not an aggressive card because that downside really hurts people who are trying to load up the board with cards. It hurts people far less who are trying to survive defensively and might be utilizing removal or their hero power for early efficient turns until they get to the late game where they can stop dropping their big taunt minions and the stuff that really keeps them alive and matters. So... Uh, definitely more of a zombie chow defensive style card in my mind, and it might actually work. I, I don't know. It just depends on the deck. If if you're a deck that has like a, an early curve that's all about, uh, sort of ramping like druid, and you are going to be casting spells, in the early game, or if you have ways to summon minions that are spells like hunter, maybe with animal companion and things like that, where you're not relying on early game minions that are going to be super overcosted because of this card, this thing will work. So. There might be a deck out there or two that tech this in to answer early aggressive uh, starts from your opponent without really much downside. So let's move on to the Terror Dax Hatchling, a new 3-mana 2-2 two, two Beast. Uh, it has the battle cry Adapt. This is another one where I just don't think Adapt is good enough here. Occasionally you'll get a 3-mana 2-5, which is okay, but it's just sort of boring. Uh, and most of the other adaptations won't make this any better and it's so unpredictable with adaptations too you have a three out of ten chance to get you know any given thing that you want uh so teradex hashling to me doesn't feel worth it just a throwaway card here one of the few pretty bad cards of ungirl so up next is the storm watcher and his seven mana four eight with wind fury so this might be the best wind fury card we've gotten yet simply because its health total is so high and that means it's going to be fairly frustrating for your opponents to kill it, unlike most of the other Wind Fury cards we've seen that have 5 or less health, which means often they'll have some mechanism to kill it and it will never get to activate its Wind Fury. So, like I said, slightly better, but I still don't think a playable card. It's I've said it a million times, when you don't have Wind Fury on defense, so they get to trade in pretty freely to a four attack minions they might have a lot of five six seven health stuff at this point by turn seven that gets to trade in for free or you know just use a removal spell of some sort and this hasn't really accomplished much so you put a lot of mana into a card that is unlikely to succeed and even when it does it's sort of an eight eight right <laughs> so uh and, and not even really that because it won't kill eight health it wouldn't kill a mountain giant in a single turn right it would die to a mountain giant trade so not even really an 8-8. So I don't think the upside here is strong enough. This card just feels rather weak to me. 
Moving on to another card that feels rather weak it is the Ultra Soar, and this guy has the weirdest art with the craziest foreshortening I've ever seen. It makes it look like his head is so big until you realize that actually his body is so very far away. But this is a 10 mana 7 14 beast, another one of those throwaway beasts, just a giant body, faceless behemoth style cards that's too expensive and too slow and doesn't impact the board fast enough. I don't even think this will be good in Arena, it's just too slow in, in any given environment. So. Ultrasaur, pretty cool idea, but just one of those throwaway vanilla cards. So moving on to the Igneous Elemental. I think, by the way, I'm almost done. Yeah, we only have a couple cards left. Igneous Elemental, new Elemental Minion. It's a 3-mana 2-3 two, with a Death Rattle add. Two 1-2 one, two Elementals to your hand. Uh, I like this one. I think this is an important piece for Elemental decks. you got to have, in my opinion at least, and my theory at least, that you're going to have to have low-cost Elementals to fit into turns and squeeze in to make sure that you're able to activate future elemental turns. And uh, this one is, is both cheap itself at 3 mana, with a sort of reasonable body. I mean, obviously understated for a 3 drop, but not a total throwaway 1-1 one, one or anything. And the Death Rattle is going to give you two additional 1 mana elementals to work with. So there's going to be a lot of flexibility in this card. It's the kind of card you just, sometimes you got that extra mana you can work with, and this will help you set up and, and keep your elemental turns rolling more consistently so i think this card will work in elemental decks even if it doesn't look that strong uh just as a raw power kind of card and then finally the volatile elemental the final card i should have saved a good one i guess for the end or a, a fancy one i don't know that, that that this one stands out a ton but this is a two mana one one uh and it's an elemental of course and it has a death rattle that is fairly good deal three damage to a random enemy minion uh the fact that that is specifically a minion and not an opponent's face i think is important because if you're playing this in the early game that's going to kill most stuff it's going to make an impact and actually trade with something not to mention that it's a one one so it can kill pirates itself and again it's a cheap elemental which is nice so i think this is playable in elemental decks i think this card is a fine early game defensive tool that occasionally might even be decent in the mid game too if it snipes off something uh rather important so there you have it. That's, I think, 31 new cards. A lot of neutral stuff, some Warlock cards, but all said, some pretty interesting stuff and really not that many throwaway cards in the Ungoro set compared to what we've seen in the past. So I think Blizzard did a really fantastic job designing this entire set. I can't wait to see it in action. The meta is going to look insanely different when we get there for Ungoro. It's going to be a fun era of Hearthstone. So many new mechanics, so much stuff new, new stuff to learn. Uh, it, it's, it's just going to be wild, guys. So thanks for joining me in this review and all my previous reviews. We finally made it to the end. This is my favorite thing to do in Hearthstone, I think. You guys have been incredibly supportive of all these reviews, so thank you so much. As always, if you have any thoughts, comments, or questions about these cards, leave them in the comments below. I love to hear what you guys have to say. You always teach me a ton. But until then, thank you so much for watching. And until next time, came on.